I grew up going to church, going to church gatherings, but I was not a follower of Jesus. And in my teen years, my parents dragged me. I didn't want to be around Christians. They made me go. They made me come on Sundays, and I thought it was so weird. It's early Sunday morning, everyone's smiling, they seem happy. There's songs about the blood of Jesus. All of it was strange to me. My parents would force me to go to youth group as well, and they would make me go on these youth group ski retreats, and I would have to smoke weed on the chairlift to cope, to be honest with you. And after high school, I, I got into really hard, this is my testimony in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> After high school, I got into really hard drugs, and my life kind of fell apart. And I was in this really dark place, and from that place, I cried out to God and encountered Jesus for real. The Jesus I had heard about became a living reality in my life. But I really struggled as a new Christian. Like, I had so much baggage from my former life, like so much sin. And it didn't all disappear. And I would struggle to pray to God because I felt so unworthy that prayers would just, you know, stick in my throat. And in one season of my life, I found that all I could pray was the Lord's Prayer. It's like I didn't have words of my own. So I had to borrow the words Jason just read. And God built on that foundation. As a new Christian... This prayer saved my walk with God. So if you don't have the words to pray, borrow these words. If you don't know how to start praying or restart praying, start here. You may be new to church or new to faith. You're exploring what it means to be a follower of Jesus. A great place to start is with the Lord's Prayer that Jason just read and we're spending three weeks studying. And as you look at the prayer, it's really divided into two main parts. The first half of the prayer is God-centered, and the second half of the prayer is centered around our needs, forgiveness, daily bread, freedom from temptation. But the prayer starts with God and who God is. And it makes sense, because the Bible starts with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God. Not in the beginning, me. Not in the beginning, us. But in the beginning, God. The Bible starts with God. Creation starts with God. History starts with God. Life starts with God. New life starts with God. Everything starts with God. So it should not be surprising that Jesus teaches us to pray by starting with God. That is in sync with reality. What is surprising is that modern spirituality tends to start with us, doesn't it? Right? My needs, my desires, my self-actualization. To quote Billie Eilish, modern-day poet and philosopher, <laughs> my thing is that I can do whatever I want. It's about what makes you feel good. Philosophers call that expressive individualism. It's the default mode of the Western mindset. And I'll translate that. My kingdom come, my will be done. And spirituality becomes the means to actualize and support our kingdom. Prayer is about self-actualization. It starts with me and it centers around me. But it's out of sync with reality. Because the world doesn't start with us, end with us, or center around us. So prayer shouldn't start with us, end with us, or center around us either. Jesus teaches us to pray in the exact opposite way. Prayer starts with God. Prayer starts with who God is and what God desires. That's in sync with reality. So with that being said, let's parse the first half of the Lord's Prayer together. And so Jesus starts with this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus teaches us to address God as Father. 
The Aramaic term he used was Abba. The family that moved in upstairs is Jewish, and I always hear the three-year-old boy call his dad Abba. It's a term of endearment and affection and intimacy. As we mentioned two weeks ago, father can be a problematic word for many different and painful reasons. So we need to let Jesus define God's fatherhood for us. In John 14, verse 9, Jesus says this, Those who have seen me have seen the Father. Think about that. Jesus defines the character of the Father. We don't project the failings of our earthly fathers onto God. We allow Jesus to define and redeem the term Father for us. There's this author, Donald Miller, who once told this beautiful anecdote. Uh, he was watching TV, and there was a writer he admired being interviewed. And the writer was asked, you know, how did you become a great writer? Like, how did you structure your practice? Which authors inspired you? And this woman laughed and said, oh no, that's not, that's not why I'm a great writer. If I'm a great writer, it's because when I was a little girl, I would walk into a room where my dad was sitting, and his eyes would light up. That is the reason. There is no other. End quote. I found that very moving. And I think we'll never pray with joy until we believe that when we, you know, when we enter our room to pray, the face of the Father lights up. Like, listen to these two scriptures, Zephaniah 3, verse 17. Maybe you didn't know there was a book in the Bible called Zephaniah. You would not be alone, but it's in there. And here's a verse from it. It says this, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we would be called children of God. And that is what we are. This is what our Father is like. He lavishes love on us. He takes great delight in us. He rejoices over us with singing. It's almost like I imagine God, you know, with a wallet in heaven, and in the wallet are our photos, and he's always taking out our photos to show the angels and say, these are my kids, I love them. This is the God Jesus reveals to us, and he teaches us to pray our Father. To pray the Lord's Prayer is to remind yourself that you're part of a family. You're not alone. God is our Father in heaven. When we became a Christian, we received a perfect Father in heaven and an imperfect family on earth. That through Jesus, we're reconciled to God and reconciled to a family of believers, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, billions strong. And I know we're out here in Vancouver, and nothing is more surprising or shocking than when a neighbor moves in and you find out they're a Christian. You're like, oh my goodness, another one. Like trying to find a Christian in the city is like, you know, where's Waldo? It, it feels like no one knows my father around here. But there are billions who know and pray this same prayer in their own language. And we say together, our father. We belong to him and we belong to one another. We pray to our Father through Christ the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit that through prayer we're invited together corporately into the inner life and love of the triune God right now where we are. Our Father who is in heaven. And when we hear the word heaven, we often think about the sky or a place people go when they die. Our Father who is far away, that's how it translates. But in the biblical worldview, heaven is not far off. All throughout Scripture, the Lord appears and speaks to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses. And when God appears and speaks, you realize that heaven and earth are intersecting realities or dimensions in our world. All throughout Scripture, heaven and God are always right here at hand. 
In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes that in him, in God, we move and exist and have our being, that heaven and earth are intersecting dimensions of reality. And there are thin spaces, moments where the veil flutters, where heaven feels close, as near as our next breath. This means that to move from heaven to earth is like passing through a doorway to get from one room to another. Sometimes when people are on the brink of eternity in hospice, they talk to you in the room and they talk to people who have passed on already because they're at the doorway and they can see into both rooms at once. Heaven and earth are intersecting dimensions of reality. Our Father who is in heaven doesn't mean our Father who is far away. It means our Father who is as close as our next breath. Our Father in heaven. But God is also holy, as we sung. God is set apart above all things and morally perfect in all of his ways, which leads to the next phrase of the prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. In the Bible, names are never just names. Names have to do with character and reputation and attributes and personality. The Jewish reverence for the name of God was so great that devout Jews wouldn't pronounce it. They would translate the name of the Lord without the vowels so that people could not pronounce it. They were so concerned about taking the name of the Lord in vain. That's how much reverence they had. This is not a common name. It should not be treated with disdain. It should be reverenced. Hallow be your name. Now, the word hallowed can mean to make holy. When Jesus prays to the Father for his followers and says, sanctify them by your word. The word sanctify there is the same word. It can mean to make holy. Now, in this case, God is already holy. So, hallowed be your name means, may your name be treated as holy. May my heart recognize how worthy and precious you are. May I recognize you as the source of all value. May I recognize you as more valuable than anything else in creation. May my actions and attitudes never treat you as anything less than what you are. Dallas Willard writes these words. This request is based on the deepest need of the human world. Human life is not about human life. Nothing will go right in it until the greatness and goodness of its source and governor is adequately grasped. Until that is so, the human compass will always be pointing in the wrong direction. We will hallow the wrong things, power, approval, money. He says, until that's so, the heart compass will always point in the wrong direction, and individual lives, as well as history as a whole, will suffer from constant and fluctuating disorientation. Then he writes, candidly, that is exactly the position we find ourselves in. That human history is largely a history of hallowing the wrong things with disastrous consequences. That the deepest need of the human heart and the deep need of our world is to hallow the name of God. May I recognize you as more valuable than anything else in creation. Or to quote Daryl, he, he draws out the meaning of this phrase, hallow be your name in this prayer. Listen to these words. Father in heaven, Father of our Lord Jesus, our own Father, Make real your character and magnify your name on earth as it is in heaven. Father, make yourself real on earth as you are in heaven. Enhance your reputation in all the earth. End quote. Hallowed be your name. To pray this prayer is deeply convicting. Because for God, or God can only really hallow his name in the world if he also hallows his name in our own lives. It's also a deeply transformative prayer because the human heart is only made whole when it hallows the name of God. Hallow be your name. 
Then Jesus teaches us to pray this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is powerful. We're going to spend the rest of our time on this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Central to Jesus' life and ministry was the good news of the kingdom of God or the reign of God breaking into history. It was a distinctly Jewish longing. And so in his book, The Gift of the Jews, Thomas Cahill highlights the many unique contributions of the Jewish people and scriptures. And one of the gifts he highlights is the concept of linear time and progress happening in history. You see, some worldviews view history as an accidental outworking of fundamental forces and chance happenings without purpose or foresight. The beginning had no purpose. The beginning had no meaning because there was no one there to mean it. The end will have no purpose. So the middle has no objective purpose either. We create whatever meaning we can grab a hold of, knowing that the grave will extinguish it and the memory of all our good deeds will be wiped away sooner or later. We make peace with no ultimate purpose. Others view history as like a cycle of, of seasons, an endless cycle. The goal of human existence is to be in sync with the cycle of birth and life and death and rebirth and life and death. History is not progressing anywhere. It's just going around the cul-de-sac. Not for the Jewish people. For the Jewish people, history is moving forward toward a goal or an end. And there's ups and downs along the way and and certain patterns repeat, and mistakes are made more than once, and there's fits and starts, but God is moving history toward an appointed end. History is moving toward the kingdom of God. To quote one theologian, the kingdom of God refers to the dynamic reality of God acting as the king. The Hebrew prophets long for the day when God would finally impose and establish his kingly rule over the entire world. They long for the day when God would intervene once and for all and rule without rival. Why? Because God's rule would mean the end of injustice. God's rule would mean the end of oppression. God's rule would mean the end of shame and hate and racism and pride and prejudice. God's rule would mean the end of mass shootings. God's rule would mean the end of cyberbullying. God's rule would mean the end of chaos. We still long for us. Our society shares the longings of the Hebrew prophets without the same hope that a king will come. The Jewish prophets believed the kingdom would be ushered in by God's anointed king, the Messiah. The kingdom's like this brand new world order inaugurated by and centered around God's anointed ruler. And through his rule, human beings become what God originally created us to be. This was the longing. And so Jesus shows up 2,000 years ago and announced that through his person, the kingdom of God had arrived. It was present. It was breaking into history. The time had come. And when you read the Gospels, Jesus' miracles or signs demonstrate that God's kingdom is breaking into history and they give us a picture of what that kingdom is like. That Jesus heals blind eyes and deaf ears. He delivers people from demonic oppression. He forgives sins. He exercises authority over the natural world. These are all signs of God intervening and doing what he alone can do. These are signs of God's kingdom. And they continue today. When I hear stories of people saying that crippling shame they had been carrying for years was lifted off of them by the grace of Jesus, I think to myself, there's the kingdom of God. When I hear about people reaching out to reconcile with family members they're estranged from, 
When I hear about necks, you know, neck injuries and ankle injuries being healed in response to prayer, when I hear about people praying for the first time that Jesus would come into their life and they say, it felt like God was inviting me to come home, I think to myself, that's the kingdom of God breaking in around us. When I hear about people confessing secret sins to their spouses and being met with grace and forgiveness, I think to myself, there is the kingdom of God. Weeks ago, Alita talked about a mentor in her life who went to Mexico as a missionary to translate the New Testament into the Aztec language. 20-year project. He and his wife were the pioneers, the first to translate scripture into the language of the Aztec people. And Alita told the story. And after the evening service, a young woman came up to her like trembling and said, I'm full Aztec. Or, you know, my grandmother only speaks Mayan. Our whole family became Christians through reading the New Testament. She had tears in her eyes. And when I hear that story, I think to myself, well, there's the kingdom of God growing and spreading, and I can't wait to hear our Father in the main language. When I hear stories of small groups pooling their resources together to support new immigrants, or to support members of their groups who've lost loved ones, I think to myself, there's the kingdom of God showing up. Or when I hear that one friend who's going through the darkest, most painful season of his life is told by another friend, hey, I know you're going through hell right now. And he responds, no. I'm not going through hell. Hell is where God's love is absent. And God has been so present with me in this season. And I hear that and I think to myself, there is the kingdom of God. And this is happening right now all around us in real time. People submitted to and set free by the rule of Jesus. And Jesus teaches us to pray for more of that. And why wouldn't we? Wasn't great timing there. Normally I'd time that out better. Uh, Many have pointed out that the kingdom of God is present, but it's not here in fullness yet. So when you read the Gospels, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God like it was present in his ministry, but also that the kingdom was coming. So it's like here, but it's also coming. The kingdom is now and not yet. It's like seeing the first rays of dawn and in that moment saying dawn is here, but it's also coming. It's like those days, you know, at the end of winter that are surprisingly warm and it seems like buds are are growing on trees and you take off your winter coat and you say it feels like spring, but you know spring is still coming in fullness. Those warm winter days are a foretaste of a future that will arrive, like a Chinook bringing with it the promise of warmer weather. Jesus says God's kingdom is here, but it's also coming. Dawn is here, and it's coming. It's here, but it's not yet here in fullness. And so we still shed tears and bury loved ones and experience chronic pain and unexpected tragedy. We still hear of shootings and wars and apathy and avarice and greed and exploitation. And the absence of the kingdom gives urgency to the prayer, your kingdom come now, and your will be done now. You do it, God, because we can't. Like when the kingdom breaks in, it makes us want to pray for more of the kingdom. When people are healed and restored and forgiven and made new and experience joy in their life with Jesus, it makes us want to pray for more of the kingdom now. And then when people are hurting and shedding tears and broken and the kingdom seems absent, it makes us want to pray for more of the kingdom here. The kingdom's presence and the kingdom's absence have the same result. Both its presence and its absence make us want to pray for more of God's kingdom right now. You do it, God. We can't. And here's a picture of the kingdom when it's fully present. It looks like new creation. Revelation 21, verse 3 to 6 says this, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. 
He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Not I am making all new things, but I am making all things new. And in the new creation, the renewed creation, God will be with his people. Heaven and earth will be married and joined as one. And for us, the most glorious moments of God's nearness now are only dim premonitions of what is in store for us. We will be like vessels tossed into the infinite ocean of God's love, filled to overflowing. And there's going to be no lack, no loneliness, no sorrow, jealousy, comparison, or feelings of not being enough because the light of God's presence will chase away all of our shadows. No more sickness, pain, or death. Racism gone, injustice gone, lies gone, shame gone, rejection gone, wiped away like a bad dream. To pray your kingdom come and your will be done now is to invite that future into our present reality. Prayer is a cry for the kingdom. It's saying, God, I can't wait for that to break in. Break in now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is the place where God's will is done perfectly. His name is hallowed. Hearts are made whole. So what is true in heaven, may that be true on earth right now. Make it so, God. You see, we cannot be so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. Not that we should not be, but we literally cannot be because heaven is coming to earth. To care about earth is to care about heaven. To care about heaven is to care about earth because heaven is coming to earth. God is not just trying to get us into heaven when we die. He's trying to get heaven into us while we're still alive. There are whole theologies built around when we get to leave this place. We're trying to escape earth for heaven while Jesus is trying to invade earth with heaven. We want to go up. Jesus wants to bring heaven down. And he invites us to join him by praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. More forgiveness, more reconciliation, more healing, more hope, more comfort, more justice, more mercy, more of your kingdom right now, which only comes when we submit to the king, which only comes when you, God, hollow your name in our lives, in our community, in our city and in our world the deepest need of the human soul our culture wants the benefits of God's kingdom without Jesus as king but wanting the kingdom without the king is like wanting the day without the sun or the ocean without the water it won't work the kingdom only comes when the king is acknowledged And we submit to his will. Because his will doesn't oppress us. It liberates us and sets us free to become who we're made to be. And Jamie, you can come up. And so we pray, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And start with us. Start with us. We can't do it, God. So you do it. Because it pleases your heart to do it. Hollow your name in us. May your kingdom come, may your will be done in us. Right now, we're open. It's a beautiful prayer. 